All right, why don't we get started? Uh, I would like to thank everyone who's uh, joining us live today for uh, this week's Virtual Spine. I'm joined here with uh, co-host um, uh, Dr. Ali Baj, uh, as well as our uh, dutiful uh, uh, coordinator, uh, Amna Hussein, who works with Dr. Baj. And we're so uh, excited to uh, welcome today uh, Dr. John Yoon uh, from the University of Pennsylvania. I got to know John. Uh, pretty well over the past couple of years and just really impressed by the work he's doing and uh, he's gonna oh, and my daughter's joining us as well but uh, we're looking <laughs> forward to hearing what dr yun has to say um uh, on these uh, evolution of cases uh all right thank you thank you Corey, and um thank you ali and uh, you know i've been a you know, big fan of both of them and uh known each other uh through the society and uh, really honored to be invited and 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 giving this talk and 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 you know I, I with the virtual talks I think I find it really difficult because you can't pe see people's reactions so um, if you um, I, I like having a more of a dialogue um, so if you guys have any comments or questions feel free to disrupt me I don't you know I think it's I, I love to hear uh, people's thoughts and 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 sort of have the dialogue instead of waiting at the end. So, um, and so, so I'll get started and then I'll have my, I'll, I'll have a chat open. So if someone wants to ask questions and, and if I don't see it, uh, please, uh, Ali and Koi just uh, disrupt me and ask questions. So. Um, yeah, uh, Dr. Yoon, uh, Ali and I will definitely interrupt and we'll make, yeah. we'll man the uh, chat box so that if anyone's uh, talking, okay. uh, chatting, we'll, we'll interrupt you. Yeah. So, uh, so today um, I'm going to talk about sort of the evolution of the surgical technique for the treatment of the adult degenerative spine disease. And, um, you know, uh, these are my uh, disclosures. Um, so I, I'm, uh, I'm at Penn. Um, uh, I'm an assistant professor. I, I, I began my career here. I did a, a fellowship. I did a residency at Mayo Clinic in Florida and the fellowship in my, with Mike Wang, where I was exposed to endoscopy and, and things like that. So uh, you know, this is a pretty big topic, so I'm just going to tackle it from my perspective, and and this is the, uh, the uh, disclosures. Um, so today, um, I'm, I'm hopefully I can convey some of the philosophies of MIS and and review the current treatment options for adult uh, degenerative spine disease, and I think you can kind of categorize them into uh, sort of a bread and, bread and butter disc herniation stenosis. And I'm going to mainly focus on those uh, of treatment of those using endoscopic techniques, and the spondylolisthesis and instability where inner body fusion techniques can be used. And then, uh, and then at the end, I'm going if I have time, I'm going to tackle some of the deformities, um, and and hopefully give you some glimpse about the future technology that can also enhance what we do today. So you know what is the current landscape of the spine surgery in the United States? And if you look at this, uh, the CDC number one disability of the uh, uh, for for adults 18 to 64 missing work is 30 30 percent back and neck problem. But if you look at look at it in more detail, like it, it's really a lot of spine problem that you see in clinic. They have uh, you know mor morbidities that that prevents them from working. So if you look at the total number of spine surgeons, this is the data from 2019, there's about 6,500 spine surgeons, about um, half orthopedic, half more, a little bit more neurosurgeons because more neurosurgeons identify themselves as a spine surgeon. And, and within the academic circle, um, uh, that, that's even smaller. So there is a, uh, uh, and then, a lot of the uh, people that are, that are in the workforce are considered sort of a uh, 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 over 55 and above. So there's going to be a, a sort of a decreasing supply of a spine surgeons, but increasing demand. So you know, if you just do a very simple calculation at the current stage in 2019, at any given time, there's about 33,000 patients per spine surgeon able to provide a care in the United States. Um, so you know, I think this, because there's so many patients and there's so much treatment options, uh, you know, the in the recent years, I think the spine surgery somewhat made of headlines and stuff like that in some of a bad light. Um, and I think that's because there's a two 
sort of differing philosophy of care. Uh, I think one way to think about the spine is sort of thinking about the farmer versus hunter. So what, is, what do I mean by that? So if you think like a farmer, uh, you want to you, you want to grow the, the the sort of fertile ground. Not everything in the imaging needs to be treated. Um, so when I see a patient, I tend to focus really on the chief complaints, not the imaging characteristics or, or the x-rays. Um, with, the, with the recent advent of the MIS surgery, I think it's okay to do less uh, upfront. You can always do more later. You can always bring the patient, stage it. And in the last point, I think the functional improvement over radiographic perfection, I think this uh, you know, is getting into a little bit of a, um, um, a sort of outcome-based uh, uh, care. And I think that's much needed in spine surgery. And I hope I can touch upon that at the end. Um, so, you know, in millimeter invasive spine surgery, you know, um, there's a lot of um, sort of um, uh, thoughts on what that is. And I like to really argue that that's a surgical philosophy rather than um, any, any of these things. And if you boil it down to, you know, there's a lot of MIS spine surgeries and comparing it to the open techniques, you can really boil it down to the six points. Um, the similar clinical outcome as open, uh, there's asterisks because not, it depends on the pathology, uh, but it definitely, I think uh, if you can do it MIS, it does lead to a, a less po post-operative pain, narcotic usage, it does get the patient up and moving faster, uh, which tends to lead to a shorter hospital stay. I think the cost is sort of a big question mark. Um, and this domain of the MIS, and, and I think really began in the DGEN spine, but now with the uh, newer techniques and um, uh, the technology, I think this circle is sort of expanding. Uh, and now it's possible to tackle some of the deformities and tumors and trauma using the MIS principles. And I'm, uh, hopefully I can show that. But, you know, a disclaimer is that, you know, really the best surgical option is, is depending on the one's technical ability, knowledge of the literature and the individual patient factors. And I cannot stress that enough. And, and then what we really care about is to send people back out into the world where they came in. Um, so what's the overarching goals of the spine care? Um, in a neural decompression, stabilization, arthrodesis, restoration of a normal alignment, which is a you know the concept that really began uh, looking at the pel spinal pelvic alignment, and we know that is that's really important, and the maintenance of the physiologic alignment over time, uh, and then that really comes with the test of time, right? So perfect X-ray immediate post-op doesn't really mean much unless you follow them through. And then I think that the restoration of the physiologic motion, uh, that uh, we achieved some of that in the cervical spine, but I don't think we're quite there yet with the lumbar spine. So it's important to keep these six goals in mind as you uh, look at these cases. And I just want to highlight, you know, the, the, with, this, with this figure that uh, the spine is a really relatively young field. And we haven't really put a, a pedicle screw until 1963, when Rory Kamel gets the credit for, put, for putting the first pedicle screw and 63 till now, which is not a, not a lot of long time. It's not really a long time that this field has really advanced a lot. And, um, and, 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 and Wang and I wrote this paper back in 2018, but from 2018 to now, there's been so many advances that, uh, that the spine is really constantly evolving. And, and as, as we all know, that there's so many different ways to get to the spine. And, uh, in, 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 you know, when, when we began the, in the training, at, I, I did a residency starting in 2012. Really, our, uh, at Mayo Clinic, we are only doing an A-lift and PLIF and T-lift. Uh, didn't really, really know anything about the lateral. Uh, but, but now the, these techniques are very routinely used in, in, in community practice and private practice. Um, so... Now I'm going to go into a little bit of nitty gritty of the sort of a bread and butter cases that you may see and endoscopic, uh, you know, discectomies and decompressions. Uh, it's been around. It's not a, 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 a sort of a groundbreaking thing. This, these techniques has been described uh, in Germany uh, and uh, Young, Rutten, Jasper and, and Tony, uh, Tony Young uh, been really been doing this for many, many years. And there's largely a two uh, approaches that you can come in transforaminal, 
where uh, you come in and expand that Kanban's tri triangle by removing that superior articulating facet joint. Or you can come in interlaminar where um, just like a tubular approach, you come off the midline and you're able to take the disc out from the midline and paracentral. Um, some people have applied a biportal access where you have uh, one hand with the camera, uh, other hole for the, for the, with the, uh, the drills and tools. Um, and people, various people have used these techniques for successful endoscopic decompression. And, and this is the foraminal pathology. Oftentimes you see uh, foraminal exiting nerve root decom uh, and compressed. And these are, um, this is where the DRG is. So uh, extra foraminal, foraminal compression can be very painful, uh, but difficult to treat uh, because they're so often midline and often uh, open technique or tubular technique can be very challenging. Um, then this is what I described, you know, laminar transforaminal, and this is the uh, example of the biportal technique. So um, I'm gonna skip through. And so this is a, a sort of the picture that you get when you come transforaminal. Um, so here I have the, I remove, I already removed the uh, superior articulating facet joint. Uh, you can use a bipolar because a uh, bipolar requires electrical um, current to go flow between the two tips. So you have to use a radio frequency uh, probe. So you're kind of heating the tissue and that, and that is the epidural vein. So when I see that, then I know if I go medial to that, that's going to be a traversing route. So this is the, uh, the disc herniation uh, to the bottom of the screen. So I want to show you a case now. This is the far lateral discectomy. A uh, 66-year-old guy, uh, chronic low back pain, sharp radiating pain to the anterior medial lateral thigh, um, presented for a year and a half that progressively gotten worse. Uh, the leg pain is worse than the back pain. Um, he rated 10 out of 10. Uh, you know, if you look at these uh, proms, uh, by all measures, he's uh, quite debilitated, uh, cannot walk longer than half of the block. Um, sort of a typical things, uh, but recent PE on Aliquis. Uh, vitals are stable. Uh, the BMI is somewhat elevated, uh, but had a positive straight leg raise and decreased light touch sensation, the medial and anterior thigh. Okay. And, and this is a pretty typical history. And uh, as you can see, the MRI shows not only the central disc herniation at three, four, and four, five, um, when you look at these, uh, and, 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 and this, is, this is why I think it's, it's, it's oftentimes you miss the foraminal uh, disc herniations because uh, he's, primary, he's primarily symptomatic from the, uh, the right side. The left side was okay, uh, but he has this foraminal disc, especially at four or five, where you can't really make out the L4 nerve. Um, so he's got central disc herniation plus the foraminal disc herniation at both of these levels. And the distribution is more in the L3, but possibly at L4. So, you know, what's the other, what's the option for the treatment for this? Um, you know, I think if you were to do this, um, I think people say maybe do a two-level laminectomy, do a midline discectomy, try to reach out as far as you can out laterally and try to pull it out. Um, and, I, and I find that surgery um, in, in very challenging. So you, you're taking the guy, uh, you're making a midline incision, take down uh, possibly both muscles, and then decompressing it, and, and, and doing a two-level decompression, discectomy, plus at the end, you're trying to look out to the foramen and try to pull out the fragments uh, from the foramen, decompress the L3 and L4 nerve roots. Uh, which I have done, but I find that really painful and, and pretty disruptive to the patient's uh, overall uh, in, in anatomy. Another option is to do tubular. Um, so uh, tubular extra foraminal, foraminal discectomy, I find that it's one of the most challenging case. Um, it, you're, you're docking and you don't really quite know where the nerve is. Uh, and all of a sudden, boom, you, you, have, you have the nerve and, and, and the nerve is um, and the disc is below you. So you're, you're trying to identify the anatomy. And, and I think I just always find that to be very challenging because also the field of depth. So you're, when you come off uh, from the skin to the uh, disc, you're talking about, about 
you know, 10 millimeter, or 10 centimeters or 11 centimeters deep. And you're trying to get the microscope uh, light all the way in there. Your hands are really far away from the pathology. So I find those to be very, very challenging. So what's the other option? You know, endoscopic discectomy does provide a, a relatively straightforward access. And, and this is the video. So, you know, um, I, this is a sped up a little bit. So the, the advantage of the endoscopic is that you bypass all that soft tissue. And this is a disc. So that's the disc at four or five. And, and so you're kind of going reverse, you're going inside out. So when you do a tubular, because your tube is so big that you have to identify the nerve move the nerve out of the way and take the disc out. With the endoscopic, you're actually sneaking around and actually I dock the tube inside the disc. So I go, I land right on the disc and do the discectomy and you'll see as I do the discectomy. So I've already done a lot of the discectomy in the disc space and now I'm pulling back my tube and you'll see the exiting nerve root kind of appear on the top of the screen. So. Here, sorry, that I should have oriented you. So the midline is in the top of the screen, laterals to the bottom, and you'll see the in, superior to the top of our screen. So that's the nerve root here coming into our view. So these endoscopic tubes are all beveled. So um, when I start to, so that's, this is actually the fragment that's probably truly symptomatic here. So as I decompress, I've already decompressed and debulked inside and I have more space. So, so that's the nerve at the top right here. Um, and that's the nerve. And this is the symptomatic disc um, that's compressing the nerve. So I'm able to go inside out where I decompress and uh, decompress this. So I know by the, by the radiograph, I'm safe. I can take out the disc. And, and, and then if I've done, if I, after I have done enough discectomy, I pull back the tube and identify the uh, nerve. And that's a pretty reliable way to take the, take the tackle this really tough thing. So I actually ended up doing a two level. This is the same thing. Um, I, the reason I included this video is that, um, you know, sometimes after you do a discectomy, uh, in the middle of the discectomy, you'll see all of a sudden, so that's the nerve right there. So nerve kind of appears in the middle and you'll see that I'm gonna use my tube as the retractor. So I reposition the retractor and I, and I continue on with the discectomy. So um, essentially, hey yeah, go ahead. I'm gonna interrupt you just cause there's a couple of comments. Um, yes. So there uh, was a couple of uh, folks who said that they would fuse these uh, with TLIF. And I'm, I'm not really uh, in the endoscopic world but I, I have heard from uh, those who do it a lot that especially for these foraminal um, uh, stenoses, they're often having to come back in several months to fuse these patients. Yes. So I guess, what's your comment on that? How, how, how do you predict, um, you know, who's going to need fusion, who's not? I guess would be my first question. Yeah. So, you know, um, I, I, I think I, again, I go back to the chief complaint. I think this guy, um, he had a primary leg pain. So I, I thought that radiculopathy, so the nerve compression was the main driver of, of his symptoms. So, and I, I, and then I often get, if I'm considering fusion and I often get flex X to see whether there is any um, active component to uh, spondylolisthesis. And if, if they do have both, if they have a back pain and there's a instability that I see on the flexion extension, then I, I think it's totally reasonable to fuse. Um, I think in this patient, although that, um, you know, he did have some back pain, that was not the chief complaint. And I did not see any spondylolisthesis. Um, I, I, I thought that it would be okay to opt for a just a decompression alone. And, and yes, I mean, that's correct. And I do follow these patients out. Uh, and if they do develop those symptoms, back pain and then this instability, then I think I offer a fusion in the future, but I do counsel them about that. Got it. Okay. Uh, let's see. One question from Dr. Selby, who's one of our co-hosts from Australia, is um, if you've ever done a T-lift after endoscopic discectomy, and if there's much scarring in those situations. Yeah. So you know, um, I actually often do uh, redo endoscopic. Um, uh, so if someone that had a, um, a reherniation after endoscopic, I go back. And, and there seems to be a less scar tissue. Um, and, um, you know, I think that that's probably a matter of 
just exposing a very little areas. So if I were to do T-lift on this patient, I would come in. So I, I, since, since I went in so far lateral, so my docking point is outside where I would do a T-lift. So if I were to do a T-lift, I would come in sort of paracentral, lamina, medial part of the facet joint, that's untouched. So uh, the scar tissue at, in those locations will not be so much of an issue. But I have done a um, um, sort of a redo um, the sort of lateral discectomies where I come in the same route. And my experience so far have been that the scar tissue is not as, is, is not a, a, as a big of a deal. You, do, you definitely see it, uh, but you, it's possible to do redos through the same scar. Right. There's actually a lot of questions for you here. So uh, yeah. uh, Dr. Pablo Quinones is asking your opinion on navigation systems, uh, aiding endoscopic procedures. Yeah, so the navigations, you know, so the tough part about this is that the uh, um, you're you're going after it. So navigation for a uh, instrumentation, you know, you can use a, a intraoperative CT scan to place the screws or the cage. That's readily available, but we're really talking about a, a soft tissue. So there, um, as as I'm um, as I'm, I'm aware, there's not a really good way to fuse the CT and MRI on like the, the brain. I think there are some research things that, that allows you to do that. So for a navigation to do a discectomy, um, I just haven't found a, a really good, uh, a reliable platform. But I think that's certainly, a, I think that's where the future is. Uh, if you can project out the sort of where the nerve is, where the disc is, uh, based on the MRI, but somehow intraoperatively, you can correlate that to the uh, bony landmark. I think that'd be a fantastic thing. Uh, but just I, I just haven't had um, found a system that reliably lets me know where the nerve is and then where the disc is in relation to the bone. One more question before we move on uh, from Dr. Birchuk. Uh, but it was, uh, did you consider uh, the use of uh, selective nerve root blocks to? see which of these was more symptomatic? Yeah, I, I, that's an excellent question. Actually, yeah, that I always do that. I'm a big fan of that. Um, and, and, and yeah, the L3 and L4. So symptomatically, I, if it's above the knee, I tend to think that it's probably L3. If it's below the knee, L4, uh, top of the foot, L5. So we all know the dermatome, but in, in reality, I think a lot of them cross over. Um, so I do try to inject them. And in this guy, I, um, I, I definitely injected and I, I don't think that was a good, uh, one way or the other. So that's why I, I decided to treat both. Uh, but yes, uh, I, if I do see something that's uh, kind of uh, unsure, I'm a big fan of doing a, a selective nerve root block. And I guess I'll just ask one more question. Uh, yeah. I think it's fascinating. But, you know, uh, the intraop x-rays, it was pretty apparent, uh, you know, pretty significant vacuum disc. Uh, at uh, you know at these two treated levels, um, does that play a role in your decision making at all? Because even though even though there's no frank dynamic instability, you know it does suggest that there's probably some motion there. Yeah, and then you know there's some modic changes. Um, you know I, I certainly agree that um, there is. You know I, did I include the X-rays? Yeah, I mean in, so intraoperative X-rays. Yeah, there is some air in the disc, but you know I I think it's hard to. Then, then where do you stop? You know, that'll be my next question. You know, the five one looks kind of bad, four five and three four. Um, really, the normal disc really kind of starts at two three. So, are we gonna do a fusion from L three to S one? Uh, and these are tough questions. And I think certainly, um, I, I, you know, there are certain patients that with this exact radiograph, and I would offer three to one fusion uh, versus doing this. And I think it really depends on um, uh, a specific patient. It really depends on your conversation with that patient. I think in, in this particular, um, you know, I try, I try to maximize the physical therapy injections and really talking to this guy, you know, he was really focused on his leg pain. Um, and and that's, that's what I decided to do. But, uh, you know, it's hard to make, um, you know, whether that's the fusion patient versus not or just decompression based on radiograph. I think that's really hard. Great, thank you. You may proceed. Yeah, so, you know, so, so, so this is, you know, um, not the same patient, but, you know, this, these are some of the um, 
you know, um, this this got to take out from the small incision. So people often ask, like, you know, how do you take out a large disc through a small incision? But really, it's the volume, right? It's the volume of the tissue. So your your tubes. Some sometimes you take out a huge disc, you know, chunk of disc, and um, and you have to remove the camera with the uh, with the disc fragments. But you could do these type of procedures through less than a, a centimeters, and then they I, I tend to send everybody home the same day. Um, so. Where, uh, you know, oftentimes when I was doing these open or a tubular, um, I was um, in a tubular, I, I, I try to send them to send home the same day, but uh, about 50% of my patients were staying overnight uh, for open procedures. If, if Whether you do a midline or we'll see approach, they often stay for me, uh, they, they, they would stay about two, three days in the hospital just to get a control of the back pain. So this kind of really after learning about the endoscopic really shifted my my practice to uh, tackling these pathology using uh, endoscopic versus other techniques that's available. Um, and so, and, and that's the extra foraminal foraminal discectomy. And that, you know, that's a, uh, that's a small minority of the uh, disc herniations. Uh, that's only about 10%. The majority of the disc herniation is in the midline and it happens between four and five and four, five and five, one. So you can tackle these uh, using an endoscopic technique. And, and this is a much more familiar anatomy because this is where we do our uh, open and, and tubular. And it's not too much different from a, a tubular discectomy, but you're not looking at a microscope, but you're just looking at the screen. So, you know, um, and, and this is a, the positioning is the key. So with the endoscopic, you're making an eight millimeter incision and you want to be able to take down the uh, take advantage of the positioning, so you open up that uh, interlaminar window, and you do that by flexing the patient. So I I do this in a Wilson frame, but you can do you can use any uh, any table that breaks, so that you really open that uh, the posterior element, and this is what you see. Uh, so I make it incision. So sorry, the so I make it incision. Identify that interlaminar window, which is very big at five one relatively big at four five and it becomes smaller as you go up to the higher lumbar spine. So um, you make an incision and you stick the tube and uh, this is what you're gonna find. You're gonna find this soft tissue that's on top of the yellow ligament. And oftentimes you, you have to take out some muscles and fat and you are gonna see a yellow ligament after I do that. So I use a pituitary to remove some uh, uh, soft tissue and, and there, the yellow ligament under the mic, uh, microscope you, looks yellow and to the naked eye it looks yellow, but under the, uh, under the endoscope, it actually looks pretty pearly white. So and that's the yellow ligament right there. Um, so that's the muscles and I use a RF probe to get me a nice window. And this is at 5.1. And 5.1 has a huge window where you can uh, sneak in the endoscope without removing any bone. So um, oftentimes when I do this, I don't have to do a laminectomy of at L5 or S1. So this is the yellow ligament. And once I identify that, uh, you use this um, uh, a sharp punch. And this punch, uh, and it's a biting tool. So you bite this and, uh, and that's the epidural fat. Uh, so Top of the screen again, the so orientation. So this is the, I hope you can see the cursor. This is the midline. Uh, the, to, the, to the bottom right is gonna be the medial and the superior is at the top and then the lateral um, and then the, and the left, left side of the corner of the inferior. So I use that and that's the epidural fat. And I, and I open the ligament all the way from the midline to the, the medial part of the facet joint. And after I do that, and you can see that there's a nerve roots here um, and the fecal sac. And oftentimes you have to remove this epidural fat, which you never do, right? And when you do an open surgery, leave the fat. It's a protection for the nerve. Uh, but endoscope, you have such a limited, uh, uh, you know, limited window. So oftentimes you have to remove this excess epidural fat to really identify the, um, the fecal sac and the traversing root. So you'll see here, as I remove this, that's the uh, traversing root, okay? And then the fecal sac is in the midline and, um, and the yellow ligament up here. So 
after you identify this, uh, this was a paracentral disc. So the disc is underneath the nerve roots. You have, um, you have to dis use a dissector, which is a blunt. And as you slide up and down, and, and you don't have enough space to fit a nerve root retractor. So what you have to do is to use that tubular retractor as your nerve root retractor. So the way to do that, um, you have to I, I dissect it out the nerve roots. And I'm using the pen field to medialize the nerve roots. I'm actually, you can't really see it, but I'm pushing down on the uh, working sleeve, the tubular retractor. And then these are all beveled. So I'm using that to rotate. And then, and then now the nerve root is actually on the other side. And now this is the disc herniation. And, um, and I make a, a punch and, and I make a hole in the annulus. And, and that's the disc herniation. And this happened to be a um, sort of a, a soft uh, disc herniation. And so as you make an annulotomy, everything kind of comes out and you can finish your discectomy. And, and then you can see that the nerve root is being retracted. So, um, it, you know, you gotta be careful when you're biting with the pituitary, you're not accidentally biting on the nerve roots. You can kind of see the, uh, uh, you can see the nerve roots right there. So, um, hey, John, that, yeah, go ahead. Hey, uh, Mike Selby's asking uh, if you've ever seen compartment syndrome after a long scope case, um, which has been described in the knee. Yes, yes. Actually, um, I haven't seen a compartment syndrome, but in a very skinny patient. So uh, the endoscope has to be done under a sort of a constant irrigation. Um, and that's sort of the, uh, the good and the bad with the endoscope. The good is that um, the reason I like the irrigation is that once I make the annulotomy, you'll see that the, a lot of the disc gets irrigated out. So uh, you see that all that all this disc kind of flows out. So that actually helps force out the, uh, the disc fragments out the tube. Uh, but the, the downside is that, yes, in a very skinny patient where you're on, under the scope for a very long time, that doesn't get forced out the tube. It, go, it dissects the fascia. And I've only seen that in a very skinny you know, uh, patients. Um, and I only have N of two. Uh, so, uh, you know, so far, I've done about 400 discectomy this way. Um, but that has happened. Now, they haven't gone into compartment syndrome, uh, but what I did in that case is that usually I close this in with the, uh, I don't close the fascia in these cases. I, I put a um, monocryl, put a dermavon, and then I did put like a pressure dressing around the, the, the incision, and it kind of resolved over time. But, um, but I have seen, I've seen that in the literature, and it's a potential risk. So one thing you have to do, make sure is that you have a good outflow and inflow. Um, so um, that, that tends to happen uh, if you don't have that established. So, um, so you know, that's for the disc uh, in a herniation. You can do these in a uh, stenosis. I'm not gonna bore you with the stenosis case. It's a very similar steps. You can drill uh, and and um, take care of the stenosis. I am going to show you some, um, some T-lift techniques that are endoscopic assisted. Um, you know, there's two different ways to do T-lift and, and some of these are already described by Wang and um, where you come in transforaminal or you can come in just like interlaminar, which is a um, decompression plus the, two, uh, plus the, uh, the cage. Um, so, you know, this is a, a patient that we treated, you know, very large patient, uh, active nursing, you know, do you do an open surgery? The like open surgery in, the, her, in her case will probably mean from lower thoracic to the butt crack, big open reconstruction, or you do an endoscopic where you really, it's, it's a lot like uh, a drilling a pipe and getting down to the source and tapping it. And so, hey John, yeah. Just go back one. Uh, what, what do you have the uh, patient positioned on here? Oh yeah, so that that's a very sharp uh, observation. So um, this particular case was done uh, with the uh, uh, awake techniques. So um, uh, in, in, this is on a flat Jackson with a Wilson frame. Now I, I know that the uh, traditionally all the fusions are done in open Jackson where you maximize the lordosis. Uh, but what we find is that uh, patients under a anesthesia, uh, awake anesthesia, so they're not, 
completely out. When you play when you place them in the open Jackson, they're super uncomfortable. I don't know if you ever actually lay down on the open Jackson table. It's terrible. It's really hard to tolerate that for hours. And and so we've actually tried it in the beginning. We put them in the open Jackson and patients are just miserable by the end. So we kind of moved away from doing that. So this is a Wilson frame, flat Jackson and collapsed all the way. And although it's not ideal for restoring the lordosis, but also we're doing these operations and not on patients that you're so worried about the alignment. So sort of a compromise if you're doing this awake. But that's a very good point. So yeah, if you do this transforaminal, um, you could do this awake, uh, come in, uh, and just like a, a far lateral discectomy, you just, you just have a bigger tool. Now, I'm not a huge fan of this. Uh, you know, um, it's not a really good expandable cage. In this case, we used a uh, expandable cage that, that goes in the collapse, then you, you, you backfill the bag with the cancellous bone. But as we all know, biomechanically, um, it's not an ideal cage. Um, but, but this is an option for someone who's a, um, either um, uh, someone very large like her or really frail lady that's not able to tolerate uh, 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 this open spine fusion or, uh, or decompression infusion. Uh, we've been offering these as an, as an alternative, but uh, by no means that this is the way that we treat all the um, spondylolisthesis. And, and another option, so uh, um, instead of coming around transforaminally, you can do these operations uh, just like the tubular approach. So um, you know, this is a typical patient that I treated, 62-year-old uh, female, uh, 30 BMI, uh, significant pain in the low back. So this patient actually had a quite a bit of uh, back pain and also um, um, the leg pain. And, um, and she had a mobile spondylolisthesis at a four or five. And, um, you, know, it's, you know, it's very interesting. Oftentimes the, the, the problem is at four or five and I don't really see a, a, in a bad deformity, but they, um, you know, this patient, uh, happen to have some mismatch in, in the pelvic, spinal pelvic parameters. Um, and um, I, 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 I don't think that she could, she somehow didn't get the MRI. I think she may have had the uh, um, some metals. So we got a CT myelogram and it shows a, uh, um, a pretty large disc herniation, central canal stenosis. Hey, John, uh, let's, uh, let's just pull the audience real quick and uh, yes. just have everyone type in the chat box. Um, how they would uh, do this case. Uh, so just give people like a few seconds on how, to, on how they would do that. Uh, wh while they're doing that, so everyone, please get involved. Uh, type, type. I'm sure there's a few surgeons out there. Uh, so type, type what you do. And then uh, in the meantime, ask, uh, answer this question, which from Dr. Burchuk, which is, um, are you using a uniportal technique on your discectomies? Yeah, so um, I, I'm a big fan of the uniportal. Um, uh, the biportal technique is great for um, uh, when you have, uh, when you try to insert a larger cage. Um, but what I find with the biportal is that I, I had a challenge with inflow and outflow. So uh, you want the, whatever fluid that you put in to come out on the other side. And, um, and oftentimes, if you make a two incision, the, the fluid kind of tends to kind of hang around and doesn't come out the other side. So what's, what happens then? Then, then you, it's hard to get visualization. Um, and, and then maybe I'm just not good at the biportal technique, but I'm a big fan of the uniportal for, uh, uniportal meaning using the one incision and one tube to do a discectomy and laminectomy. And, and, um, and, and that's the way I, I've been doing um, a, lot of the lem, uh, a lot of the laminectomy and discectomy. But the right, so biportal technique is possible for the t -lip. All right, so we've got, uh, uh, four out of 43 brave people who would contribute to what they do. So there's one vote for open T-lift. Uh, Dr. Baj, our fearless leader, would be uh, doing a tubular decompression. Uh, Dr. Vergara, an OLIF, and Dr. Burchuk, uh, an open uh, a decompression, posterior lateral fusion. You know, for me, um, uh, you know, low crest, uh, I like, uh, you know, prone lateral for this with, uh, with mental preparation, that'll be a very deep uh, retractor. Uh, but let's hear yeah. what you did. Yeah, no, I think I think I think all those are very reasonable 
um, you know, ways to do this. And, and, and yeah, I myself, I'm, I'm a big, pro I, I love the, uh, the prone lateral um, just because you can maximize the lower doses. You get a very large, nice footprint. Uh, and I think, frankly, you probably get a really good correction of the lower doses and, and especially in the coronal plane. And I think those are all good, uh, a good point. Um, but one, one thing I, I would argue for a, a TLF or posture approach is that this patient had a, such a severe stenosis uh, with, the, uh, with the disc plus the, uh, the facet joint being so large. I, I saw a lot of stenosis here. So I thought that the patient um, needed to be uh, decompressed. So with the lateral approaches, I find it is really hard, even though there is, I, I do believe in the uh, indirect decompression. I think that's real. Um, I find that it's really uh, makes me uneasy that leaving all that posterior compression, uh, just doing the anterior column work makes me feel uneasy. So, uh, so I chose to do a uh, the, the the T lift. Now, you know, as you know, the, there's many different ways to do T lift. Uh, my my least favorite of uh, ways to do T lift is a tubular, because I think it's really painful. Uh, and Ali, Ali Baj is a lot better than me in, in doing a tubular T lift. And there's masters out there that can do tubular T lift very well, but I think a tubular T lift technically I think is a very challenging thing to do. You're working around uh, a limited um, amount of uh, visualization, and again, uh, this is a BMI 30, but you know you're working through a um, you know oftentimes a 22, 24 millimeter tube, and uh, the depth is usually around you know eight centimeters, ten centimeters, which is very very tough. So I decided to do this uh, endoscopically assisted uh, and, and use a tube at the end for a cage insertion. So I'm gonna jump right to the, uh, the you know, surgery. So uh, just like the endoscopic uh, decompression that you saw, but I'm gonna drill more. So that's, this is the uh, joint. It's all, you can see that already it was uh, unstable. And uh, this is actually a five millimeter drill. So it's possible to put in a, uh, a fairly sizable, so the, the, um, the inner cannula, inner diameter on, the, on these tubes are 7.8 millimeters. And the working channel can accept five millimeter uh, the drill. So you'll see me kind of go back and forth. That was the, uh, the cutting burr. Uh, this is the diamond burr. So as I get closer to the um, yellow ligament, then I kind of switch back and forth. And again, this is the joint line right here. Uh, this is the lamina. And I, I kind of switched to the uh, the kerosin here. So that's the yellow ligament. And, and I kind of go back and forth here. Uh, that's the kerosin and, that, and then that's the drill. So I'm, I'm drilling the lamina and then the facet, medial part of the facet. And now after I have enough space here, you'll see I'm taking down the yellow ligament and that's the tra traversing route coming into the view. Um, and then you'll see the exiting nerve. So that's the exiting nerve. I'm kind of taking away the fat tissue. And, and then uh, traversing root is kind of at the top of the screen. Um, and uh, again, I'm, I'm dissecting the nerve roots so that that's the disc uh, space right there. Um, and um, after I mobilize that traversing root, I've already expanded the uh, canvas triangle and I'm gonna start the discectomy. I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit. So this is, the, this is the disc coming out. And then, um, at, and then, so I did all the decompression. And at the end, when it's time to insert the cage, um, there's not a really good expandable cage. I could have inserted a, either Spinology or uh, there are some other companies like Flarehawk that offers the um, sort of expandable option. Um, I was not a really a big fan of those cages, uh, so I decided to do a um, just a static cage, um, and I'll show you what it looks like. So this is the static cage that I inserted. This is a nine millimeter cage, that just a bullet cage, very uh, standard. So after I do a decompression, I stick the tube, and this I believe this was a fourteen millimeter tube, so I didn't have to really use twenty two millimeters. And I may, and then I, I made a little bit bigger incision to get the um, uh, 14 millimeter tube, and then I, I get I get my nine millimeter cage in there, and then the perk screw at the end. So um, I was able to reduce her, 
And I, I see this very often. I don't know if you guys see it. Like, um, I think the, the lumbar lordosis is a very, uh, it's a function of the disability and pain. So sometimes when the, uh, when you treat the slippage or you treat the, the symptomatic uh, spondylolisthesis, the global overall global alignment tends to get better. So, um, um, so, you know, this is the sort of a, a outcome of that. John, great, yeah. great result. Uh, two questions for you. Uh, one is from Pablo Quinones. Um, and I think you might actually know the question here because I know you do a lot of great work with, uh, you know, accelerometers and stuff, but uh, his question was if anyone um, uh, finds or uses gate lab analysis for deciding what type of surgery to offer. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a very uh, a great question. And uh, we're actively actually in investigating that. Um, I don't think there is a, a good sort of a standardized gait sort of pattern that predicts, um, you know, what a good outcome uh, when you do this approach versus another approach. I, I really don't think that there is a lot of work that's done. Um, but I think that's a good research question. And I, um, and I think that's an important one because... I'm, I'm certain that uh, one approach for one patient will be better. Uh, and then that same approach may not be best for the other patient. So I think more objective assessment of the patient function before and after surgery is, is, is a very important thing that we should be investigating. Great. And one question from Dr. Vergara is whether he, um, you use navigation for these. Um, so I have not traditionally have been using a navigation, but certainly um, it, it, it can be helpful to put the screws in and sort of track uh, where your drills are, uh, see where the cage is going. So I think navigation will be hugely helpful. Um, so, so I'm, I'm actually going to uh, skip because I think the lateral fusions, I think uh, I actually want to get to another, uh, another case. So um, uh, let, me, let me just skip these. Um, so uh, I want to actually focus on deformity because I think the deformity, I think, represents uh, something that, um, you know, the MIS uh, is sort of beginning to scratch surface. I know Koi and, 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 and does, Koi and uh, Juan, and there's a lot of leaders that does, and, and Praveen, they have published a lot on uh, sort of combining the uh, anterior uh, construction and then sort of staging the posterior column. And I think, um, and, and I wanna show you some cases that I've used and applied sort of the same uh, you know, um, uh, principle. So this 61 year old guy, um, some comorbidities, uh, the septic bursitis, uh, he was not an IV drug abuser, uh, but he presented with a significant back and leg pain for um, a two month, uh, pretty skinny guy, but, but, but can, can barely walk. And he had this uh, 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 sort of uh, enhancing mass in the epidural space. And then, you know, th here's a guy, not a drug abuser, but he, was, he had a septic bursitis. So I recommended just doing a LAMI, taking a biopsy of this, draining it, and then follow up. Um, but he was lost to follow up, went somewhere else, and he came back with this scan about three months after um, someone tried to do an, an A-lift on him. You can kind of see. So someone did a, so he had a, this, this is a three, four. So he comes into my clinic uh, uh, three months later with this type of scan. So he had underwent three, four laminectomy outside. They did do some epidural le lesion removal, um, got infected and didn't heal. Maybe it was already infected. So I had to wash out three times. And then, and then they went in anteriorly, did a three, four A lift, um, did, did a screw, but you can see the screws are all broken and uh, backed out. So this is the MRI. Uh, this is the cage, the screws. I think one of the screw uh, was in the foramen. So now he's unable to stand upright by all measures of the, uh, the disability. He's severely, um, um, Disable ODI of 74. He actually lost weight. So he's went from 189 to 171 in the matter of about three months. So, um, you know, he was stuck in this position for several months. Um, so it's hard to really assess the uh, SVA. 
so if you look at the pelvic incidents, so, um, you know, it's mismatch about uh, 50 degrees. Uh, in, in these cases uh, where they're, uh, you know, they're, they're crunched up, uh, I like getting a T1 pelvic, uh, the measures, um, and, 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 you know, by all measures, this guy has a, a significant deformity. Um, and I don't know if I included the uh, AP, but there was not any major scoliosis and coronal, and coronal plane. So, you know, what to do in this case, um, you know, maybe, maybe Koi, uh, what would you do in, in a case like this? Yeah, so can you go back to um, the uh, CT actually? So I think the key oh, here is that, you know, on his uh, supine imaging, he's, he's okay, right? You know, he, he clearly, clearly sort of collapses forward, but I, I think um, uh, you probably don't have to do as much as you might think based on his standing films. But you said he's already had an A-lift? He had an A-lift at 3-4, yes. Yeah, so, you know, I think um, at least my access surgeons, I think if it's, you know, the previous interventions are maybe, you know, less reliable. Uh, so for me, this is probably, you know, all posterior, uh, multi-column uh, uh, inner bodies and uh, posterior column osteotomies. I, I suspect pr probably don't need a, a three column, uh, but, you know, based on what you got, um, I guess kind of uh, three column in that fuse segment would be pretty hard. So I, I'd probably just see what I could get um, posterior inner bodies with uh, PCOs. Yeah. I'd be interested what, uh, you know, uh, Mike Selby's a deformity guy, uh, so is Ali. Yeah. Uh, Ali saying T10 to pelvis, uh, all posterior. Uh, same answer as me, I guess. Uh, yeah. Any other thoughts, Selby? Selby likes to A lift everything. <laughs> Mike? Yeah. Um, you got me, Koi? Yeah, I got you. Yeah, tough on a previous approach, I think, but 3 4 is a different compartment from 5 1. Um, look, you know, it's only. I, I kind of agree with initially going all posterior here and seeing what you can get. Um, and, you know, that ALIF is just um, completely subsided, sunk in there. It's a peak cage in infection. And I suppose the only yes. question I've got is, is that an ongoing nidus of infection or problematic? And do you have to pull that out with some sort of uh, corpectomy? Um, but getting the patient stable first from the back sounds pretty reasonable here and and you know whether they're up for a prone lateral or not or whether you come back and and do a lateral there i think you also have to be flexible right if you can't get it all from the back you may have to be prepared to do a prone lateral and drop here and just take out that whole segment uh to a prone lateral corpectomy that's a pretty big off uh, yeah. so you gotta make sure the patient's up for that but uh yeah i, I wouldn't be rushing to do another a lift here at three four at least yeah, no, I think I think those are all my thoughts too. And um, yeah, luckily the cage um, didn't seem like this was one of those cages that had that peak component and it had like a two metal thing that goes above and below. And and I thought that you know removing that, I would have to do like two level corpectomy, and that's a big gap that I'm leaving. And I and I'll be working through sort of a like scar tissue that was previously um, operated on and plus it's got infection in before. So um, I decided to skip that level, but um, you know, whenever I see these black discs, um, I, I, you know, I, I, I kind of think that there's a, a good, good way to get a lot of the lordosis corrected uh, doing an anterior column. So I did sort of a, a three stage operation. So uh, I first put him on prone, remove all that crap from the back, and I took a look um, in the back and see if there's any corridor I can get in. And the three, four was just all stuck. Um, I didn't really have a great plane. So I closed and I flipped him um, in a lateral position. I did a lateral from one to three and uh, did a, a, a lift in a lateral position. That was, that was all done one day. So stage one and two was done in one day. And I stood him up and see how much I need to do in the posterior to really get a good sense of like, you know, do I need to do PSO three column versus just getting away with a PCO. Um, so this is what I did. I put him on this. Uh, so I did, I removed the screws and, and stood him up. So I did a, a lateral above. I skipped the four five here because it was so fish mouth and, um, and, and I didn't really get a good uh, look at the four five disc. 
there was like a lot of uh, uh, adhesions and burned out like infection. It was adjacent to the L34, so I skipped that. Did a 5-1 lateral A lift and stood him up and, and looked like, it, this kind of looks like what he looked like on the supine CT. Um, so after that, I know I needed about 30 more degrees. So I ended up taking back uh, two days later, did a T10 to the pelvis, did a PCO in the back, and then I was able to, to correct him. So, um, you know, I, this is about, uh, and then I got a CT scan afterwards and uh, ali alignment looked pretty reasonable. Um, and yeah, so the A lift and a lateral, I got about uh, 15 degrees and then I got a I got about another thirty degrees from um, the the PCOs. So uh, this was done about um, about a year ago. I saw him back, and then he's he's due to come back. Uh, he had a terrible knee uh, hip, um, so he got actually got a hip replacement on the left side. Now he's got a bilateral hip replacement. Um, he was still like very uneasy to stand up. Um, so this is all, all I am able to really get, uh, sort of a sitting down x-ray, but, um, hopefully, I mean, overall he's doing okay. Um, and, um, you know, I'm kind of worried about his, um, uh, you know, tilting. I didn't really correct his, uh, you know, the, all, uh, deformity all the way. Um, uh, but I'm, this is someone that I'm going to be following for a while. Um, so you know, John, I think you can just blame it on the hip surgeon. <laughs> yeah you know the hip versus the, the back is always a, a the argument so, so you know I, um you know uh, are you wrapping up yeah so you know I, i'll wrap up by you know i think someone uh, you know these are these are some of the uh uh you know prone lateral i think we kind of briefly touched on uh, John, but, i'm you know, sorry to keep interrupting you know, by the yeah. way, uh, we're happy to, this was fantastic and we're happy to have you back. I see you prepared a lot of slides. We're happy to have you back yeah. to go over them, uh, the, the others for sure. This yeah. It's fantastic. Yeah. But yeah, if you want to, if you want to wrap things up, uh, oh, okay. Yeah. If you want to wrap things up with any, some final statements, uh, then I can close it out for us. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think I, I, you know, I was able to share some sort of hodgepodge of, uh, uh cases, but I think these are pretty, uh, routine, uh, the cases that, that we see uh, in, in, in spine practice. And I think there are, um, you know, more um, uh, different techniques that are coming out at that. I think really endoscopic, I was not exposed to this until my fellowship year. So I've been doing endoscopic surgery for about uh, three, uh, the four years. And I really kind of expanded my horizon. And, and I think, you know, um, the principles of the MIS is going to sort of that circle, I think is expanding and there are ways to really treat these uh, tackle, even the really the difficult surgeries like deformity where traditionally it really, the only way to treat it is either a lift or T lift uh, or um, uh, PLIF and going all posterior. Now, I think we can stage these operations uh, and, 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 and then be able to kind of sort of achieve the same goals of the open surgery, but uh, doing it, do it in a way that's like more uh, lessens the morbidity. So, um, but thanks for listening and, uh, the, the comments were really excellent. Yeah, no, the, again, that was really uh, great. Uh, we're so glad that you, you joined us and since you already have stuff ready, I'll, I'll invite you back for my next, uh, my next turn. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thanks again for your time. Uh, uh, and, uh, we'll see you all next week. Thank you for your invitation. Thank you guys. Yeah.